Well, we really got blessed with uh, union with Christ a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I about got shouted out of the pulpit, everybody praising the Lord. When the Lord began to show us the depth of the meaning of being united with Christ, to remind you what we covered a little before, only in Christianity are persons united with a personal God. In the other religions, many of them, we said there is a union, but it's by absorption in the deity where they become one with the world soul or universal soul, the absolute. But salvation in Christianity is not a loss of identity, but a restoration of the image of God in all its fullness. Second Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We were discussing the nature of the union. That's where we got so blessed. We saw in Ephesians 5, it's a mysterious union. It's a mystery. There are just some things you can't explain. Uh, the new birth, uh, Jesus didn't try to explain it to Nicodemus. He showed him how. You could see the effect of it as the wind blows in the trees. A mystery. Secondly, we saw it's an actual union. This isn't a figure of speech. As we looked at John 17, Jesus said, I pray that those who believe on me will be one even as we are one. Well, we know he's one with the Father. He said the Father and I are one, one eternal spirit. Not the same person, but one eternal spirit. And we are one with God. And we were, we were shown how that we have the divine nature, 2 Peter 1 4. Again, most Christians don't know what they have in salvation. Although it's a mystery, we said uh, there are analogies in the Bible, and we were dealing with those. First was the analogy of human nature. The Bible says we're all in Adam. Well, how are we in Adam? By nature. We descend through human nature. We descend from Adam. Well, how are you in Christ? The same way. You're in him by nature, the new spiritual nature, the nature of God. John 17, remember that he prays that we be one as the Father and the Son are one. So that's not a figure of speech. Now, that was the analogy of human nature. A second analogy, here's where we begin tonight, is the analogy of the vine and the branches of John 15, 1 to 5, that show union with deity. We maintain our personality, but we are literally united with deity and union with Christ. The figure over and over is being in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Well, John 15. Here is union, and the analogy given here to show the mystery of the union is the analogy of the vine and branches that Jesus gives. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch, that's us, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So don't be surprised when the Father lovingly corrects you, sometimes called chastening. Correction is a little nicer word, but uh, it hurts just as much sometimes. So he purges us. He's talking about those who abide in him. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. The band abide not in me, Verse 7, if you abide in me, and on and on. So he's uh, using an analogy of vine and branches to show the mystery of union with Christ. Remember, it is a mystery, Ephesians 5. But we said there are analogies that help us to understand it. Now, there's something about the union with Christ that is not true of all men. Passages like this, like John 15, repudiate the error of the fatherhood of God, which we mentioned earlier. God is not the father of all men. He's the creator of all men, but he's the father of only his children, those who become children by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in connection with having life in him, in the first chapter of John, 
we see that Christ lights every man who comes into the world. But it's only those who abide in Christ who have eternal life. So there must be a difference between the life that God gives all men and the life that we have as Christians in Christ. Because here in John 1, we're told that Jesus gives life to all men. John verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So John 1, 8 and 9 speaks of Jesus lighting every man. And they use texts like this to try to teach fatherhood of God. But if they'd read the next two verses, they'd see he's not talking about spiritual life or new life because he came to his own and his own received him not. Now in verse 11, he's still talking about those he's given life to. But some didn't receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. So it's only those who uh, are in Christ who receive him, who have life as far as new life through the new birth experience. So John 1, 8 and 9 is talking about the life principle that as sinners, all men are birthed into the world by nature as sinful. In the relation to God, the scriptures show us in Ephesians and Colossians, they're alienated from God. All men are alienated from God. And so whatever life that we have is not the same thing he's talking about in John 1, 8 and 9. That's the life principle. But the new life principle, which is a new birth, is the life of abiding in him spoken of here in John 15. What I'm trying to say is that, that there is a life that God gives all men, but there is a spiritual rebirth that he gives to his children who believe on him. Then there's another analogy showing this relationship or the mystery of this union, and this is called the analogy of the temple or building. Ephesians 2, verses 20 to 22. There are analogies of our union with Christ, is what we're saying. Ephesians 2, verses 20 to 22. Verse 20, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are described here as a temple that he indwells by his Spirit. Now the same thing, of course, is set forth in 1 Corinthians 6 that God is in us. Of course, other passages say we are in him, but 1 Corinthians 6, 17 to 20, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Verse 19, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? See, we're called a temple. Now, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the temple, but all of those things that happened in Israel... The worship and the forms and everything were patterns of spiritual realities that literally, literally happened to us. There was an Old Testament temple, but that was a type. That wasn't God's end or purpose. That was simply a type. That's why all of the New Testaments are not two different Bibles, but one is the foundation of the other. So your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you which you have from God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. But the Holy Spirit, he says, is in us. We're, we are his temple now. So the analogy of the temple or the building of God he shows this mysterious union. Then there's another analogy given in John 6 that the Catholics and some others have uh, foolishly taken literally. 
I don't know why they don't make Jesus the door if they're going to take everything literally. He says, I'm a door, and why they don't look like branches and him, him like a vine. But here's the analogy of partaking of Christ's sacrifice, the Catholic error of the doctrine of transubstantiation, where when they stand before the altar and say certain words in Latin, Latin the bread and wine are supposed to become the literal body and blood of Christ. But this is the analogy of partaking of Christ by doing that, he's in us. He is the figure of eating him as he offers himself. But he goes on to say, I don't mean literally eating my flesh. That would profit you nothing. He says, it's the words I'm speaking to you. Eat of those. They are spirit and life. John 6, uh, verses 48 to 56. We partake of his sacrificial offering by faith. That's how you eat of him, his flesh and blood. The Jews stumbled, even his disciples couldn't understand it. But it's the analogy of partaking of the sacrifice of himself. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead, but this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were willing to follow him as long as he gave them literal bread. Remember, he multiplied the loaves and fishes. And he said a little earlier in this chapter, he said, you don't follow me because of what I'm saying or the miracles. You're following me because you've got your stomachs filled and you want me to create more bread. And then when he starts speaking himself as bread, uh, right away, they stumbled over that. But as long as he worked miracles and fed them, they were willing to receive it. But Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. They stumbled over him just saying, I'm the bread of life, and he's really giving them both barrels. Now, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, even he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Well, verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? When he knew they were murmuring, his own disciples murmuring, he said, does this offend you? Well, he says, what if you see me go back up where I came from? <laughs> then verse 63 explains it. I don't know how the Catholics missed it, and some Protestants, bless their hearts. He said, they said, how can he give us his flesh to eat? How can we drink his blood? That's cannibalism. He says, don't you understand, verse 63, it's the spirit that makes alive the flesh profits nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit which gives the life. It's believing his word about his sacrificial offering. You ever hear of a disciple eating him? He was available on the cross. He died. I mean, if we've gone to just get in carnal terms like the Jews were. Why, why take a cracker and a, some grape juice or wine? They had, they had first hand there. Obviously, they didn't think he meant that. Only the Catholics dreamed that up. I mean, his disciples came to see what he meant. He said, it's the words I'm speaking to you. He says, eating my flesh would profit you nothing. There it is, verse 63. Read it. How could you ever stumble when he makes it so plain? And he doesn't always bother to explain himself. He just, he just says, those who are looking for a way to stumble will find it. Uh, you know, when I got saved, I got into John, found election and all of that, and just, you know, just accepted that as God being God. And I got over in John 6, and it never occurred to me that he expected me to take that literally. And I didn't know anything about the Bible. You really have to have a spirit <laughs> to read into things like this. Even if I don't know what it means, I know it doesn't mean that because he told the Jews here, it isn't my flesh that would profit you. He says, it's the words I speak. They are spirit, spiritual, which can give you life if you believe them. Well, he went on to say, but there's some of you that don't believe. So he's talking about believing. Well, the analogy 
of partaking of a sacrifice. That's how he comes in us. As we partake of it by faith, he indwells us. As he teaches all through his word. By faith in his sacrificial offering, then he indwells us. In spirit. Not literally, obviously not literally. Now, the mystery of the union is symbolized in two things we witness all the time, baptism and the communion, the mystery of the union. There's a whole lot about this mystery in the Bible, even though it's a mystery. The mystery, first of all, is symbolized in baptism, Romans 6. Now, the whole Bible is directed toward our understanding, redemption, so I trust that none of us treat this merely as academic, but... If you, if you let, allow the Spirit, he'll show you what God would have you to know of the deeper things. Baptism, chapter 6, 1 to 5. Christian baptism is a reality of the mystery being acted out. That is, it shows our death to sin, our resurrection to a new life. While... The water doesn't wash away sins, while the baptism in itself can do nothing to transform a man. The baptism, though, is a witness to a reality. So it's more than just a symbol, as we Baptists were taught to say. It's more than a symbol, but the baptism in itself is not the means of obtaining grace. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So the baptism depicts the mystery of union with Christ. We're united in his death and in his resurrection. Then communion, 1 Corinthians 10. The communion of the bread and cup, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. We're all made partakers. For we're all made partakers of that one bread. Not only is Christ in us and we're one with God, but the communion, again, is more than a symbol. There's, it's not a means of grace, but it witnesses to the reality that he's in us, we're in him, and we're all one together, partakers of the one bread, so that makes us one body. Now, the word commu translated communion here is really koinonia, which is fellowship. The cup of blessing which we bless, it's the fellowship of the blood of Christ. And the bread which we break is the fellowship of the body of Christ. And so we fellowship in him and one another in the communion. But it's more than fellowship in a secular sense. It is the mystery again. So the union of Christ being a mystery is explained some by, anal uh, by analogies. Now let's look at the benefits of our union with Christ. What we benefit from this. I'm sure this will be a blessing. First of all, first benefit some of these things of course we've mentioned in connection with other things but first benefit is that we receive the divine life of God through union with Christ now the divine life of God that's eternal life God knows neither beginning or end no death and we receive that kind of life when we believe first John 5 11 and 12 by our union with Christ we receive divine life. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has this life, and he that has not the Son has not life. So the life of God is in Unitarianism and Deism and all of those isms that deny the deity of Christ and the eternal sonship of Christ. No, the life 
of God. If you ever receive it, it's him the son. And when he's in you, that's the life. Because it's the spirit of God. Or the spirit of Christ, which is the same thing. Then, as we've already seen, secondly, a second benefit, we become partakers of the divine nature. Now, that's not the same thing. Second Peter 1.4. Where we have life, but God could give you life without giving you of himself. But Second Peter 1 4 makes this remarkable statement that God has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Partaking of don't be afraid to say what God says about you. Partaking of the divine nature. Now we've already covered that. Thirdly, a benefit is that we become new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17. New creation. Not new creatures, as King James says, but a new creation. That's being born again, John 3. If any man be in Christ, we're talking about union with Christ. If you're in him and he's in you, you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. One of the tests of whether or not a person is in union with Christ is if all things have become new. If just the only change that you can find, as is true and so often in denominational circles, that the person was going to the golf course or the saloon or wherever on Sunday morning and now he goes to church but nothing else has changed then that doesn't mean he's in union with Christ he says all things have become new now those three things that we receive the divine life divine nature and we become new creatures that means then literally we become children and sons of God literally children and sons First John 3, it says we're born as children of God. The seed of God is in us. Galatians 4 calls us sons of God. Romans 8, sons of God. Now, we've already looked at all those scriptures. First John 3, Galatians 4, Romans 8. We literally, because of those other blessings, benefits, we become children, sons of God. Another benefit is we become joint heirs with Christ. Galatians 4, Romans 8. Joint heirs. Twice it is said we're joint heirs. We do a lot of preaching on this in the faith realm. Joint heirs. Everything that belongs to him is yours. He's son of God by nature, but you're son of God by adoption. That makes you a joint heir. Now a joint heir is not just someone that received eternal life. And his sins are forgiven. What belongs to him belongs to you. Those of us who believe it are receiving it. It's that simple. Another benefit is secures for us all spiritual and temporal blessings. Our union with him. All spiritual and temporal blessings. Not something that's going to happen. These things have already happened. A lot of them may yet to be fulfilled, but uh, you have them already. Ephesians 1, 3. Secures for us every spiritual and temporal blessing. Ephesians 1, 3. God has blessed us with this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. It's always in Christ. That's the key. That's what we mean by union with him. We've already seen it's an actual union. This is a figure of speech. As he and the Father are one, he says we are one with God. It's a mystery. He doesn't try to explain it, but I'm going to believe it because he says it. So God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. What's it mean? I don't know what it means. I just know that uh, Paul said, I has not seen, ear has not heard. Uh, a lot of the spiritual blessings are issuing, issuing in on us now when we believe for them, but there are things in the heavenlies yet to be revealed for those of them. 
I mean, what your greatest desire is in this, in this uh, earthly realm, in a spiritual sense, is nothing compared to what God will reveal to us in the heavenlies when we meet the Lord. Then Romans 8, 31 and 32 speak of this, what is given to us. Romans 8, 31 and 32. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Freely all things. And people are running around begging and pleading for the Father to give them what he's already given them. All things. All things. 1 Corinthians 3 says all things. 1 Corinthians 3. Our union with Christ secures for us all spiritual and temporal blessings. Not just spiritual, temporal. 1 Corinthians 3 is all things temporal as well as spiritual. He says in verse 21, all things are yours. Whether it's the world, the world, that's temporal. Life, that's present. Now, Death, things after. Things present are things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ's. And Christ is God. If you're in Christ, he says, it's all yours. Why do you argue about I follow Paul, and somebody follows Peter, and somebody follows Apollos, and another party in Corinth said, we don't follow anybody, we just follow Jesus. No man. Well, he said, they're all yours. Not only is Christ yours, Paul yours, Apollos is yours, Cephas is yours, but the world is yours, life is yours, death is yours, things present as well as things to come. Not just the things to come, but things present all are yours. Well, and all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. In Christ. If you're in Christ, he's already said yes to every promise. You meet the condition, you receive it. Another blessing or benefit being in Christ, it secures for us completeness. Completeness in him. Colossians 2.10. We are complete in him. Uh, I dare say there isn't one out of a hundred knows what it means to be complete already. They're waiting for things to happen. That's why they don't. Colossians 2.10. Verse 9 says, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now that's an antidote. Verses here and the ones we just read concerning all spiritual and temporal blessing are ours. Those two things are an antidote for uh, people who are always confessing inferiority or inability poverty, defeat. There's no excuse if he says we're already complete in him for you saying, I can't. I don't think it would work if I'd try. I'll fail. I, I just don't have enough education. I lack the ability. I can't afford it. I won't be able to go. Whatever it is you're confessing, he says you're already complete in him. You ought to be confessing, I can do all things in Christ. Complete. Not going to be complete. You're already complete. He says it's all yours. All spiritual blessing, all temporal blessing. The world is yours. Life's yours. Death yours. Things present, things to come. All yours. Christ is yours. Paul's yours. We've got Paul right here. Some people... Won't follow Paul. Others, all they follow is Paul. They're all ours. Which gospel you like best? I like them all because they're all mine. <laughs> Which book do you like in the New Testament? Luther said he didn't like James. He said that's a stroy little book uh, because James said if faith has not works, it's dead. And Luther had battled to get all that works religion so much he let the pendulum swing the other way. And so it was grace to the point that he neglected the Christian life a little too much. The way the Baptist brethren got started, the Lutheran church got pretty secular because it didn't teach the crucified life. 
Well, that's another story, but uh, we are complete in him. Then it secures for us participation, another benefit. It secures for the believer a participation in Christ's total redemptive experience. Now that's really a heavy one, as they say. We just gave you something very profound. And if Christians really knew some of these things we're trying to get across to them, they wouldn't confess and live and act the way they do. They wouldn't say, I can't, or I won't be able, or it'll never happen, or there's an exception. Because there are aspects of your participation in Christ's redemptive work, experience, rather, that enable you to have authority over the devil, Amen. or to have your needs met, or to know there's no such thing as defeat to faith. Uh, trust that will become clear. We're saying it secures for the believer our union with Christ, a participation in Christ's total redemptive experience. Now, I didn't make this up. It would never occur to me. That's why it's a part of the mystery. But the Bible says we were crucified together, died together, buried together, made alive together, raised together, exalted together, and glorified together. Do you know the Bible said that? That when he died, you died. The Bible says that. In fact, we're going to preach a little on that, just that point Sunday, but crucified together. All right, Galatians 2.20. I'm saying that union with Christ gives you the privilege of participating in every phase of his redemptive experience. Now, that's very crucial, as you'll see in the message Sunday. It's not that you are participating in the sense that you're adding anything to his atonement, but he so identified with us and through our faith in him, our union with him is so, so vital and so close that the Bible speaks of everything that happened to him happens to us in his redemptive work, even the suffering. Now, if you look at the word, you'll see that does it say, uh, we're not only not making it up, it's very important uh, for you to know this and uh, to believe it and to appropriate it. It'll help you live up there in that realm of victory that some of us do. Amen. Crucified together, Galatians 2.20. What does it say? I am crucified with Christ. So you see, we didn't make it up. Then Romans 6.6 6 says the same thing. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. No, you weren't hanging on the cross, but legally, by your faith in Christ, everything he did, it's like you doing it. It's imputed to you like you died, you were raised, you all of this, you see. Some things are not just imputed, but they actually become realities, like glorified. All right, he says we're crucified with him. There's two passages. You can look up more. I'm sure he says it more than that. Uh, Crucified together, then when he died, we died together. Romans 6, while we're there, we'll look at that. Romans 6, verses 3 and 8. We died together. Knowing this, know ye not that so many of us as are baptized into Christ are baptized into his death. So we participate in his death. Verse 8. Now we are dead with Christ. If we believe we're dead, then we'll also live with him, you see. So you died with him. Colossians 2.20 also states that we died with him. Colossians 2.20. I'd like you to see these, so I'll take the time for you to turn because there's nothing more profound in the whole theological concept of union with Christ than this fact that we participate in his whole redemptive experience. And that'll... That'll change your outlook if it really becomes a part of your thinking. Uh, Colossians 2.20 Wherefore, if we, be if we be dead with Christ, then, of course, we're freed from the rudiments of the world, you know, and so forth. So he assumes we're dead. That's what he means. And then in verse 3 of chapter 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. You died with him? Now, there are three places he said you're dead. 2 Corinthians 5.14 takes it out of the realm of speculation, if there is any out there tonight. 
And it couldn't be any plainer that when he died, you died. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The Greek literally says, if one died for all, then all died. All believers died when he died. You see, we've stressed over and over and over and over. I have said and tried to point out to you, the Bible speaks of things in a legal, judicial sense. That God just didn't arbitrarily forgive you or say this is the way of salvation or whatever. But because we were bankrupt and he wasn't, he sent his son to pay the debt. There's no other way you can approach God. Even any kind of works is an abomination to him. And judicially, as soon as you exercise faith in his son, it's just like a transaction in court, even more so. What you see down here that's a legal transaction is just a small type of what really takes place in the courts of heaven when a sinner repents. As soon as a sinner repents, God immediately, it's a legal transaction, he says, I impute to him the righteousness of my son. Now, he never looks at you anymore and says, well, he's not really righteous. And uh, he's not really, uh, he's just a sinner saved by grace. God no longer even thinks in those terms. He just sees you as if you had obeyed and been righteous, even though it's imputed to you. So when Jesus died, God saw every one of the elect dying as if they were paying the cost because they were going to have faith in his son and he saw it as if we all died, you see, and paid the, paid the price. So praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So God isn't just playing little figures of speech games with us. If he says we're righteous in faith in Christ, that if he counts us as righteous, then he sees us as righteous. That isn't something that can be taken away from us. He counts you as if you had done what you couldn't do for yourself. And it's, it's such a legal transaction that it is, it's absolute. The love is in the cross. But when, when the transaction takes place, you better believe that there's a, a righteous judge sitting on a throne that would not compromise one iota of your forgiveness. And by your mustard seed of faith in his son, he sees you in Christ. All he ever sees is you're in Jesus. That means righteous, righteous, righteous. Well, there you are. I gave you four passages, said you're dead. And that last one, I'll tell you, that one will preach. Uh, that, that, he said, if one died, then we all died. Now, God said that. So believe God, that you died with Christ on the cross. He did the work, but God counted it as if you did it. And that's Romans 8, 4, by the way. He says, you know, that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us by our faith. It's actually fulfilled by your faith. That's if you did it. Well, I don't know that everybody is ready to say what God says, but uh, I've been saying it for a number of years that uh, what God says we're going, to, we're going to preach and teach, and those who get a hold of it are going to get blessed. We're buried together, Romans 6, 4. You actually got buried with him. Therefore, we are buried with him in our baptism, into his death. That baptism isn't just something he arbitrarily dreamed up one day. I think I'll have everybody be baptized in water uh, in my name. Uh, I don't have to have a reason for it or explain it. He does a lot of explaining of what baptism signifies. And when you're laid down in that water, at that moment, you're buried with him, you see Yes, that's symbolizing something, but isn't symbolizing a symbol or a figure, but a reality. You get buried. You not only suffered and crucified and died, but you're buried together, Romans 6, 4. Ephesians 2, 5, when he was made alive, he didn't come out of the tomb. He wasn't resurrected when he first came to life. You know, he had to open his eyes and come to life. It says, we were made alive together with him, Ephesians 2, 5. After he's made alive, then he was raised. That'll be the next one. But Ephesians 2.5 were made alive together. Even 
When we were dead in sins, God quickened us together with Christ. It didn't say he quickened us. Quickened, of course, King James means make alive. He didn't say he just quickened us. He says he made us alive with him. When he was made alive, we all came to life. We were dead in sins and trespasses. The moment he came to life, every believer down through eternity came to life at that moment. Now, from our side, the historical standpoint, there's a time in history. But remember, God isn't involved in time up there. That's why he can say these things. We died with him. We were buried with him made alive with him, and then we were raised with him. Raised with him. Romans 6, 4, and 5, and Colossians 3, 1. This is all because of our union with him. We participate in the whole redemptive experience. God looks upon us as if we were doing it. That's what he means by being one. If he's going to do it, for us, and yet we are one with him, it's like we're doing it. You see what union means? It isn't him off there doing something for us in the sense that he's over there and we're over here, or we're down in history someplace not born yet. When he died, we died with him. When he was raised, we were raised with him. That's why God can say these things, because we are one with him in that act, in all those experiences. Now, I didn't make it up. God said, if he died for all, then all died. That's tremendous. If you can't handle it, just stay with it until God lets you handle it. You're not, you're not making the atonement, he says, over and over and over and over. You can't do that. But his people are so one with him, they died with him. And raised with him. What are we on? Raised together? Romans 6, 4, and 5. We're raised together. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of Father, even so should we also walk in newness of life. If we've been planned together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That means you got a lot of italics in there. That means that right now you're supposed to be in the likeness of his resurrection, not you're going to be. You've already, when you're baptized... You're buried with him in the water, you die. Yeah. You die, you're buried. He says when you come up out of the water, that's to walk in newness of life. Of course, it can already happen and should if you were saved a week before you got baptized. Obviously, is isn't yeah. saying that everyone gets baptized immediately. But the baptism symbolizes the reality. It isn't a figure. Uh, Colossians 3.1 says we were raised together. If ye then be risen with Christ. When he died, we died. When he was raised, we were raised. If you're risen with Christ, then seek those things which are above. Because that's what he seeks. Then we were exalted to the throne of God with him. Exalted together. Ephesians 2.6 Exalted together. Verse 5, even when you were dead in sins, he made us alive together with Christ and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenlies, in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. It's in him. You've already been exalted into the heavenlies. God has raised us up together, you see, in him made us sit together. Where is he sitting? At the right hand of God? That's where you are. You don't have to fight and labor to try to get the victory over the devil. You are warring against the powers of darkness from a place of victory. The right hand of God exalted. You're already there, God says. So accept it by faith and start broadcasting that to the devil when he comes against you. He says that he's exalted in Ephesians 1 far above all principality and power. Those principalities and powers in Ephesians 6, you see, are the powers of darkness, Satan's kingdom. But he says we've been, chapter 1 says Christ is up there at the right hand of God, now far above all principality and power. Chapter 2 says we were caught up when he was caught up. We've been exalted with him. You're in him, friends. You, your body may be here and he may be there. But he's in us and we're in him. And so we are there even though we're here. And one day what's, what is 
hard for you to conceive with the eyesight will be very easy to conceive because it will be seen when he says those who overcome will sit in my throne with me in the millennium. But you're already there. You're in him. He's in you. In fact, there's really no separation there and here and all of that because the spiritual dimension just super, superimposes itself upon the material. See, when there was nothing material, nothing created, there was just the spiritual, invisible, intangible. So when God created something, he had to put that into his invisible, intangible. So it's really already there. So you don't have to go off somewhere to be exalted. That's what your faith's for. Then we, we are glorified together. Romans 8, 17 with verse 30. Glorified together. Romans 8, 17 and verse 30. Verse 16 says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Now there it says that we, as he suffered when he walked the earth, we've got to suffer so that we can be glorified. But that's dealing with it from the literal, realistic, or the standpoint of, what is true right now, but from God's side, no time is involved. So verse 30, with God, it's already done. You're already glorified. Verse 30, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Past tense. He's already done it. From our side, we have to act it out. We have to suffer with him that we can be glorified with him. But from God's side, he doesn't see you as some cancerous, cantankerous, crummy, dirty old spirit, he sees you as glorified. Amen. Already. Amen. That's why you shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit, he says. You are sealed against the day of redemption. So live in such a way God is glorified. Hallelujah.